So we're continuing our study of God's mountain tent, AKA Mount Sinai and the tabernacle. And before we jump in, as always, because we are still trying to grow and expand this YouTube channel, if you haven't already, please subscribe, click the like button, click the notifications bell, leave a comment, anything you can do that will let YouTube know, not just that you watch this video, but that you actually like it and you wanna see more videos like this. That helps bump us up in the algorithms, and that really helps us grow this online ministry. And as always, for you Bible nerds out there looking for gifts or some sweet fashion accessories, head over to our store. We've got a number of designs, everything from shirts to mugs. We've even got flip-flops, beach towels, and posters. So take a look around. Some of it's jujitsu stuff, some of it's Bible stuff, some of it's kind of an in-between. Anyway, take a look, see if you like anything. And if you do, pick something up. It really helps us when you do. And if you follow me on Instagram, I'll put my Instagram handle right here. I post whenever there are sales in our online store. They're usually flash sales for like a day or a weekend or something like that. So give me a follow on Instagram if you want to see whenever those sales pop up, as well as other Disciple Dojo related stuff. Okay, let's get into part two of this study. Now, in the last session, we looked at the symbolism in the ancient world of temple building after a victory and how that spans both Old and New Testament. So God used a common ancient Near East motif to communicate to his people in a way that they could understand culturally, but also in a way that had distinct differences from what they were familiar with in their culture. Now, in this video, we want to shift gears a little bit because there's big question about the location of Mount Sinai. Where is Mount Sinai to begin with? Some people think this is a settled question. You know, they've taken the tour. Tour, they've been to the monastery. But if you look in most good study Bibles, you'll see this is far from settled. In fact, one of the things that has kind of vexed biblical apologetics for a long time is there's not really any physical evidence around Mount Sinai, at least the location in the Sinai Peninsula, that concords with what we read in Exodus. Now, here's an overview of the ancient world that Israel was familiar with. So Goshen, this area was where the Israelites lived for the most part. We don't know if it was maybe here, if it was up here, if it was all of it, not really sure. But this general area is known as Goshen in the land of Egypt. And here's the Sinai Peninsula. Up here is Canaan. And at the time, in addition to the Canaanites, along the seashore here were the Philistines. So the road going from Goshen to Canaan was known as the Way of the Philistines. Then over here, you had the peoples of the Transjordan. So you had the Ammonites up here. You had the Moabites kind of right here on the east shore of the Dead Sea. And then between the Dead Sea and down here at the Gulf of Aqaba, you had the land of Edom, the Edomites. Then below the Edomites in this area was Midian. This is where the Midianites were centered. Now, there are a lot of proposed ways of the Exodus, routes of the Exodus, and I'm not an archaeologist. I am not going to say that I'm an expert in each of these ways in particular, and, and that's not the purpose of this. You can check some of the resources that I'll link in this video description below if you want to dig deeper, archaeology pun intended, about which particular route and what the details of that route were. But in general, there are two locations that are the most probable for Mount Sinai, three locations that people have proposed as Yam Suf, the Red Sea or Sea of Reeds, and then three routes that people think maybe the Israelites took. So let's look at the most traditional one to begin with. The traditional route that you're going to find in most study Bibles, most evangelical material, most maps of the Exodus, it begins up here in Goshen. The Israelites leave Goshen, and right here in Egypt, there is this series of lakes and canals. This became the Suez Canal. This is where all the shipping lanes in the world go through. In the ancient world, these were a series of lakes that, known as the Bitter Lakes. So some have proposed, because these lakes have reeds that grow all around them, and the word Yam Suf literally means Sea of Reeds, that the Red Sea, Yam Suf, was actually referring to one of these Bitter Lakes, and that's where the Israelites crossed. And then from there, they traveled down into the Sinai wilderness, and they arrived at what is the traditional location of Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa. So this is one traditional theory. A variation of this theory is that the Israelites left Goshen, 
and not one of the Bitter Lakes, but they came down here to the northern point of the Gulf of Suez, this arm. And the Gulf of Suez, somewhere along this shore, is where they got stopped by the waters, and that's where God parted Yom Suf. And again, because there are a lot of reeds that grow in the marshy areas in this part of the Gulf of Suez, people say that makes sense. It's the Sea of Reeds. So after they crossed over to this side, then they continued on, and eventually they arrived at Mount Sinai. So these are variations of what's probably known as the Southern Route of the Exodus. There's another route, and it says, no, the Israelites, they left Goshen, and they went for a few days, for we don't know how long, the text doesn't specifically say, but they went towards, not the way of the Philistines, but they went towards, in general, the promised land, and then God told them to turn back and to wander in the wilderness. And Pharaoh would then chase them because he thought that they were lost, wandering in the wilderness had closed them in. So they ended up here, not on the Gulf of Suez in the Red Sea, but on the Gulf of Aqaba in the Red Sea. And so somewhere in the Gulf of Aqaba is where the Israelites crossed. This is Yam Suf. And they ended up crossing and made their way to Jebel al-Laz in what is now Saudi Arabia. So this is known as the Arabian route or the Arabian theory. There's a variation of the Arabian theory that is a little bit different. And it says, no, they left Goshen, they traveled down, but they traveled down all the way to the Straits of Tehran. And at the Straits of Tehran, that's where God parted the waters and they walked across because it's only like two or three miles right here. And they made it to, again, then Jabal Allah's. So this is a basic overview of the various routes that are the most probable. There are some others that people have proposed and some variations of these variations. But in general, this is kind of what we're looking at in terms of the most probable locations, not just for the two Mount Sinai locations, but also for the different routes that the Israelites may have traveled to get there. Now, one of the cool things about modern technology is we can actually look at this and what it would have looked like thanks to Google Earth. So we can zoom in the traditional approaches. They would say the Israelites left and they got hung up at this area, the Bitter Lakes. Now, this is a modern image. This is the Suez Canal. Obviously, this wasn't there in the time of the ancient Egyptians. And there were a number of lakes and marshes and reeds dotting this. So if that's the case. Israel may have ended up coming down and getting stuck somewhere and thinking, oh, we can't get across, and then the Egyptians pursuing them while they're camped here, and so God parted these waters. And then others say, no, it was more likely the Red Sea, Yom Suf, and so Israel would have traveled down here, and they would have gotten hung up somewhere on this shore. We don't know exactly where. And so God parted the waters, and then they crossed into the Sinai wilderness. And after doing that, they would have come to what is today Mount Musa in Egypt. And you can see, here is the traditional location of Mount Musa, the mountain of Moses, Mount Sinai. This is a popular Christian pilgrimage site, and this is where many scholars think Mount Sinai is located. So we'll jump back to Google Earth in just a minute and, and look in more detail, but let's look at what the Exodus account itself says and some of the clues that it gives, as well as other parts of scripture, and see where we end up. So in Exodus 13, verse 17, it says, when Pharaoh released the people, God did not lead them the way of the land of the Philistines, though it was nearer, because God said, lest the people change their mind when they see war and return to Egypt. So for whatever reason, God didn't want this newly group of liberated slaves, his people, and the mixed multitude of Gentile Egyptians who had come out with them, didn't want to lead them from freedom from bondage right into battle. They weren't ready for that. So God led the people around by the way of the desert to the Red Sea. I'm using the Lexham English Bible in Lagos here. And Red Sea, the note points out literally Sea of Reeds. So every time you see Red Sea or Sea of Reeds, it's this Hebrew word, Yam Suf, or two Hebrew words. So I'm just going to say Yam Suf. So God led the people around by the way of the desert to Yam Suf. And the Israelites went up in battle array from the land of Egypt. There's some irony here that they went up as if they were ready for battle, but God knew they weren't actually ready for battle, which is why he didn't lead them into battle. And here's where we need to pay attention. And they set out from Sukkot, which means thicket, or hut, or even refuge. So we're not sure if this is a, a place name, if 
this is a settlement, if this is a known location, most of the locations in the Exodus can't be identified with certainty. But they set out from Sukkot and they encamped at Etam on the edge of the desert. And Yahweh was going before them by day in a column of cloud to lead them on the way and by night in a column of fire to give light to them to go by day and by night. The column of cloud by day and the column of fire by night did not depart before the people. We don't know the time frame. We don't know how long this took. This could have been days. This could have been weeks. We'll get a time marker later in the account. But right now, we just have God leading the people out of Egypt to the edge of the wilderness. Then we come to chapter 14. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to the Israelites so that they may turn and encamp before pi And this means mouth of the mountains. pi Mouth of pi the mountains. So God tells them, no, turn around and camp in front of mouth of the mountains. And then he clarifies between Migdol, which means tower, and the sea. Before Baal Zephon, which is opposite of it, you will camp by the sea. So wherever they camped, it's by the sea. It's at a place called mouth of the mountains. And there are markers there that they're camping in between Baal Zephon and Migdol. And here's why. And Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are wandering around in the land. The desert has closed in on them. This is a key phrase. The desert has closed in on them. So the whole point is they're supposed to look like they're just wandering aimlessly. And I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and he will chase after them and I will be glorified through Pharaoh and through all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. And Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he chased after the Israelites. Now, the Israelites were going out boldly. Now, for the whole question of why did God harden Pharaoh's heart, what does that have to do with questions of determinism and free will? We have a video here where we've actually gone in depth on the concept of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. So after this, check that out if you haven't already, because it's really important for understanding what's going on in the Exodus account and what role human decisions play in God's sovereign plan. But then we read, and the Egyptians chased after them. They overtook them and camped at the sea all the horses of the chariots of Pharaoh and his charioteers and his army at pi before baal Zephon. And Pharaoh approached and the Israelites lifted their eyes and there were the Egyptians traveling after them. And they were very afraid. The Israelites cried out to Yahweh and they said to Moses, because there are no graves in Egypt, is that why you have taken us to die in the desert? What is it you've done by bringing us out from Egypt? Isn't this the word we spoke to you in Egypt saying, leave us alone so that we can serve Egypt? Because serving Egypt is better for us than our dying in the desert. So this isn't like a silver bullet or nail in the coffin for either proposed Exodus theory. But what it does at least imply is that wherever the desert, the wilderness is, it's outside the bounds of Egypt. So part of determining the route of the Exodus would hinge on where the generally considered boundaries of Egypt were considered to have been at that time. So then God tells Moses, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it so that the Israelites can go in the middle of the sea on dry land. And the angel of God, who was going before the camp of Israel, set out and went behind them. And the column of clouds set out ahead of them, and it stood still behind them, so that it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And it was a dark cloud, but it gave light to the night, so that neither approached the other all night. So you have God creating a buffer. The angel of the Lord and the pillar of cloud and fire are serving to not only illuminate everything all night so the people can travel by night, but also to be a buffer between the advancing Egyptian army and to hold them back until the Israelites can get safely across. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh moved the sea with a strong east wind all night. And he made the sea become dry ground, and the waters were divided. And the Israelites entered the middle of the sea on dry land. The waters were a wall for them on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians gave chase and entered after them. All the horses of Pharaoh, his chariots, his charioteers, into the middle of the sea. And during the morning watch, Yahweh looked down to the Egyptian camp from in the column of fire and the cloud, and he threw the Egyptian camp into a panic. And he removed, or this can possibly be translated as he turned, the wheels of their chariots so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, we must flee away from Israel because Yahweh is fighting for them against Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, let the waters return over the Egyptians, over their chariots and over their charioteers. This is the well-known story that's been portrayed trade countless times in movies and cartoons, but it doesn't end there. After Moses celebrates him and Miriam with the song by the sea, then he's reunited with his father-in-law and his wife. And then in Exodus 19, they come to Mount Sinai. And this is what we read. In the third month, 
after the Israelites went out from the land of Egypt. On this day, they came to the Sinai Desert. So the total time now, we have a time marker at least, generally, is it took them three months to the day from when they left Egypt on Passover until they got to Mount Sinai. So that's kind of the window of time that we have to work with in formulating whatever theory we think best fits the data. They set out from Rephidim, wherever Rephidim is, and they came to the desert of Sinai and they camped in the desert and Israel camped there in front of the mountain. So wherever Sinai is, that's where the mountain is. And this is where it's important to note what the opening chapters of Exodus already have told us about where God and Moses had their encounter. Back in Exodus 3, before any of this happened, we read Moses was a shepherd with the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west of the desert. This could also sometimes be translated the, the opposite side or the far side of the desert. It's a general vague direction, not a specific location. And he came to the mountain of God to Horeb. So then we know the story. Moses sees this bush. It's burning, but it's not being consumed. He thinks that's weird. He goes over to see it. And God appears to him and speaks to him from the midst of the fire. And they have their back and forth. And God tells Moses, you're going to go bring my people. And Moses defers and no, I can't do it. And makes some excuses. And then verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring the Israelites out from Egypt? And he said, because I am with you. And this will be the sign for you that I myself have sent you. When you bring the people out from Egypt, you will serve, and the word serve in Hebrew is also the word worship. It's a word play throughout the Exodus. You will serve slash worship God on this mountain. So this mountain that Moses is to bring the people to is the mountain of God. And so that's what happens in Exodus 19. Exodus 19 is the fulfillment of Exodus 3. Moses brings Israel back to that mountain. In verse 3, it says, Moses went up to God and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you will say to the house of Jacob and you will tell the Israelites, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to me. And then he gives them the beautiful promise in the Exodus. Now, if you will carefully listen to my voice and keep my covenant, you will be a treasured possession for me out of all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, but you you will belong to me as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is a pivotal moment in the covenant history between God and his people. He's saying, I'm bringing you out. I'm bringing you to this mountain in the wilderness to transform you into my covenant people so that you will be a kingdom of priests. You will stand between me and the nations and you will bring the nations knowledge of me. That's the big picture plan of the Old Testament. So the traditional route has Israel leaving Goshen, crossing and the Exodus event happening somewhere at the Bitter Lakes. And then it takes them three months to arrive at Mount Sinai. Now, this is around 150 miles or so. So regardless of if it's the Suez Canal or the Bitter Lakes, in the traditional route, Israel goes from here to here in about three months. And the different places are stops along the way. But there's one key problem biblically speaking, with this route. Now, the other times that Yom Suf are mentioned in the Old Testament, they're always mentioned in connection with this place called Ezion Geber. 1 Kings 9.26, King Solomon built a fleet of ships at Ezion Geber, which is near Elot on the shore of the Red Sea, Yam Suf, in the land of Edom. 1 Kings 22.48, Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish type to go to Ophir for gold, but they did not go for the ships were wrecked at Ezion Geber. So Solomon made ships to go down here for gold, but it says the ships were wrecked at Ezion Geber. And 1 Kings 9 says Ezion Geber is near Elot on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And then 2 Chronicles 8, 17, then Solomon went to Ezion Geber and Elot on the shore of the sea in the land of Edom. 2 Chronicles 20, he joined him in building ships to go to Tarshish. They built the ships in Ezion Geber. So Ezion Geber is here at the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. Today, this is Israel, this is Jordan, the cities of Elat or Elot. Those are both names mentioned in these accounts. So this is where Solomon built his ships. Ezion Geber is on Yom Suf, and Yom Suf, according to every other mention in the Bible, is the Gulf of Aqaba, 
not the Gulf of Suez. So biblically speaking, there's a strong case that Yam Suf is not either of these locations, but actually it's somewhere in this branch of what we know of as the Red Sea. And lo and behold, on Yam Suf, on the Red Sea, there's this place called Nueva, Nueva Beach. And it's a wide expanse, and on both sides, you have mountain ranges. But if you're Israel coming out of Egypt, one, it would be odd to describe any of these locations as out of Egypt or out from Egypt or the wilderness, because this is pretty thoroughly Egyptian territory. It actually pretty much all of this was at the time, as far as I know. Remember the text says God didn't lead them the way of the Philistines. So he had them leave a different route. And then he told them at some point to turn back. Now this is general areas known as the way of the wilderness. There was an ancient road that cut through here over to Edom. Remember this is Edom, the land of Esau, where Ezion Geber is. So at some point along this route, God said, turn back, and I want Pharaoh to think you're wandering in the wilderness. Well, if you just look at the landscape here in this area, you find all of these dry riverbeds, these wadis. So coming along a wilderness road and then turning back, if you ended up in any of these areas, look, they all funnel out to Nueva. And we'll switch to 3D here and you can get a sense of it. Wandering in the wilderness, wandering about, being lost among these valleys, wadis, and the armies of Egypt coming after you. And then the Israelites arrive and they set up camp on this beach. And look, it's between two mountain ranges. Pi Haheroth, mouth of the mountains. And the only thing standing between Israel and and escape is the sea. So do we know for certain that Nueva Beach is Pihaharoth? Was there a place, Baal Zephon here, and Migdol built here, and Israel camps between? None of these are certain, but it does make sense of what we read in the text. And after crossing Yam Suf, they would have wandered in this wilderness area and made their way from camp to camp at these different places. And then eventually, Three months after leaving Egypt on Passover, then they finally arrive at Jebel Al-Laz. And this today in modern Saudi Arabia is known as Mount Sinai. And there's some interesting things about Jebel Al-Laz. For one, you can see the top of the mountain is this obsidian dark material. And it's not like the rest of the mountain around it. This area had some volcanic activity, but there's this point on the mountain where the whole top of the mountain has this charred black look to it. Is this proof that this was the mountain where God descended in fire and cloud and thunder and Moses spent 40 days? Again, no, you can't prove any of that. But it's way more of a candidate in terms of its physical description than the traditional site over in Sinai. Now, as I mentioned before, some have said, no, it wasn't Nueva Beach, but Israel actually crossed at what is the Straits of Tehran. And some adventurer explorer types have gone here and they've noted that in the Straits of Tehran, there's a network of coral reefs that stretch. And this, again, you can see buildings here. You can see roads. If you zoom in, those are three diving or fishing boats. But this is not a massive distance between Sinai Peninsula and Saudi Arabia. So if God removed the water in some way from here through a strong east wind, then they say Israel could have crossed through here. One of the problems is this area has a lot of coral and it's very craggy and you know you can't really walk on coral and the depth is very uneven. It's just, it, it's not, you know, it would be hard to walk across even if there were no water here. Whereas Nueva Beach, this area, there's pretty much nothing here. I mean, this, this whole Gulf of Aqaba is super deep on both sides of this, but this area is relatively flat, sandy bottom. So if the water weren't there, this is somewhere you could walk across. So at the end of the day, these are the three most likely routes that the Exodus would have gone through. Now, traditional archaeology has uncovered nothing at the original Mount Sinai that the text describes. There's no archaeological evidence of the Exodus having taken place here. Jabal al-Laz is in Saudi Arabia, and only recently 
has the Saudi government allowed tourists to come here? There hasn't been archaeological research that's been allowed for most of the past 20 years or so. This has been closed off only recently has the Saudi government opened up access and allowed people to come. And that may have to do with current Saudi, Israeli, American relations trying to be strengthened. But regardless, there has not been centuries of archaeological work, professional archaeological work done in this location. So it's too early to say with any degree of certainty that this is the correct place. But at the same time, there have been over a century of archaeological work done here and nothing's turned up. So we're basically left with Mount Sinai, the traditional location in Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, or Jabal Allah's Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. And here you can see it. And there's the blackened top. But we do know from scripture a couple of things. We know that Yom Suf in the Bible describes this body of water. Yom Suf never describes this body of water in the Bible. We also know that the mountain of God, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, where Yahweh first appeared to Moses as the burning bush, and then where Moses brought Israel back and where they were given the Ten Commandments, is somewhere in Midian, near Edom. And that is this area. For the traditional location to be true, this area would have to be described as Midian or at least the west side or the far side of Midian. But that's a long way away, especially because there's no way to cross this ocean. So it's a little odd to think that Moses would have brought Jethro's sheep all the way to here. And this is hundreds of miles. Shepherds graze pretty far, but I'm not aware of shepherds grazing that far away. So unless this area was known as Midian, which to my knowledge, nowhere in scripture is this area known as Midian, Mount Sinai is in Midian, and this general area is Midian in the Bible. So putting those together, to me, the weight of evidence is heavier that this is Mount Sinai, and this is the Red Sea that Pharaoh's army drowned in, and it's all out of Egypt, then trying to fit this being Yom Suf, and this being Mount Sinai, and this being considered out of Egypt. Not conclusive, but from the biblical evidence alone, this is why I say I think this is Sinai. Now, you may be saying, hold on, I've never heard this, and I haven't seen this in Bible maps in my study Bibles. All the maps in my study Bibles have completely different routes than what you're saying. None of my study Bibles mention this Arabian location. And it's true, a lot of study Bibles don't even give the Arabian location of Sinai any mention at all. If they do, it's in passing. But if you've seen the Bible reviews I've done here on the channel, you'll know this is my study Bible that I prefer. And lo and behold, the archaeological study Bible by Zondervan has two whole pages on each of these routes. It deals with the Southern route theory and the traditional evidence for that. And then it also gives the Arabian route theory and the evidence for that. You can see the review I've done here on the channel. And in the article on Midian, I've zoomed in on a couple of the passages here. It says, passages that associate the Midianites with the Moabites, however, suggest that both groups lived in the southern part of the Transjordan. The Midianite soldiers also fled in this direction after Gideon's victory. Evidence from ancient scholars such as Ptolemy, Josephus, and Eusebius, as well as information from classical and medieval Arabic geographers, indicates that the Midianite homeland was on the Gulf of Aqaba. This would place Midian in northwestern Arabia, one proposed site of Mount Sinai. Then in their article on the location of the Red Sea, in this section it says, Today, many believe that the most likely candidate for the Red Sea would appear to have been Lake Timsa. That's one of those bitter lakes that we looked at. Although other lakes in the northern tip of the Gulf of Suez are also possibilities. There are, however, significant problems with this interpretation, and an alternative viewpoint places the Yam Suf in the same place at which 1 Kings 9.26 puts it, at the Gulf of Aqaba. And then lastly, in their article on the locations of Mount Sinai, the whole, a whole article that covers this whole discussion, at the very end, they note, in regard to the Arabian theory, Demetrius, a third century BC Jewish historian, made this connection. The apostle Paul stated that Mount Sinai was in Arabia, Galatians 4.25. And so if we go there, in Galatians 4.25, Paul is going to make an analogy. He calls it an allegory. We don't have time to get into all of the imagery and what he's trying to say theologically, but just look at what he notes. In the illustration that he's attempting to make, he says this offhand comment. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. There it is in Greek, clear as day. Sinai mountain in Arabia. 
And so the Archaeological Study Bible ends with a very wise word of caution. They say, as always, caution is necessary. Archaeology is not an exact science, and archaeologists have not fully investigated the possibility of an Arabian location for Sinai. At the end of the day, beware when you hear people make confident pronouncements about things having to do with the archaeology of the Exodus. When you hear Christian sensationalists say they've proved the Exodus, here's the real place where the Red Sea crossing happened. We found chariot wheels in the ocean that date back to the time of the Egyptians. And all. Just, it's not like you have to say, well, no, that's wrong. You don't reject it out of hand, but just recognize that archaeology is not a specific science. Most of these place locations cannot be determined with any high degree of specificity. We have to allow for a wide range of interpretations, and we have to realize that we're talking about an event that happened in the 1400s or 1200s BC, so over 3,000 years ago. And we need to taper our expectations of what that would constitute evidence to prove something. We also want to be aware of the radical skeptics and the revisionist reconstructionists who say there's no evidence of an exodus. There's no evidence that the Israelites ever came out of Egypt. It's all folklore that got embellished or it was created in later documentary sources and blah, blah, blah. No, you can't say that either because the main locations that the biblical text itself gives haven't been excavated with the degree of thoroughness that other more well-known sites have. So part of the reason why there hasn't been a lot of evidence for the Exodus, I think, is because researchers have been looking in the wrong places. But overall, these are the general theories of the Exodus crossing of the Red Sea and the locations of Mount Sinai. And you're free to believe whichever of these you find most convincing. For what it's worth in terms of agreeing with the rest of what we read in scripture and the overall geography of that area, I think this Arabian route makes the most sense. This is the one I think is the most compelling. I think the Straits of Tehran make not quite as much sense, although maybe a possibility. I don't think the traditional location makes very much sense of the text at all. But I also know that way better Exodus scholars than me would disagree with me. So I encourage you to look into it and see which you find more convincing. If you are interested in knowing more about the Arabian theory, then I recommend, of course, the Archaeological Study Bible. It's out of print, so you have to find one of these on eBay now, unfortunately. Zondervan, get your act together and reprint this study Bible. It's amazing. can't believe it's out of print. Another resource worth checking out is The Exodus Case by Dr. Leonard Moeller. It presents a pretty thorough overview, got all kinds of illustrations, photographs, maps, and it does a good job, whether you find it convincing or not, it does a good job of laying out the evidence. And there's also a documentary, you can watch it on YouTube, it's called The Exodus Revealed. Moeller is one of the people that contributes to it, there are others like Frank Moore Cross who are interviewed in it, and it too provides a pretty compelling case for the Arabian route theory. So I'm gonna link those in the description below. Take a look, I think they're really interesting. And again, even if you don't agree, even if you end up saying, no, I think there's better argument for the traditional route, great, that's fine. Because it's not gonna change the overall message of what Sinai is attempting to teach. It will make apologetic difference in terms of to what degree you think scripture concords with archeological findings and geography. But the theology of the Exodus this and the literary message and the symbolism isn't changed regardless of which of these locations you think is the most likely. And that's what we're going to take a look at in the next video in this series. We're going to be looking at Mount Sinai specifically. I'll be working from the assumption that it is the Arabian location, but everything I say is going to also be able to be applied to the traditional location as well. But we're going to take a look at the events of Exodus 19 and Exodus 24 and what they show us, and not just about Mount Sinai, but about what God gives to Moses on Mount Sinai. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Should be coming out in the next week or so. In the meantime, if you haven't already, subscribe. Click the notifications icon so you'll know when that video is released. And if you found this interesting or helpful, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think, what you find to be the most compelling. And if you have other Bible nerd friends who would be interested in this discussion, share it with them. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo.